Um, well, I welcome you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure to me that we have Petra Wagner here. Uh, I think we all know Petra, many of us in person and others from her writings, to talk about prosody. Uh, before we go to this, I would like to say a few things about our plans. Well, uh, up to now, we had the conferences, now one every year in different places, and now we are going to have one tutorial per month. Each month we will have a tutorial where we can meet, discuss methodologies, collaborations, or whatever. Well, coming back to the lecture, I would I'd like to say a couple of words about prosody. I mean, prosody, although it has been studied from antiquity times, like length distinctions and tones, it was really very, very, very neglected during the last decades. Not the very last, but many decades. As Mario Rossi in his tutorial in Athens many years ago, he said that in Ghent, in Belgium, in 38, 1938, we had only three papers in prosody. <laughs> if we go, it was something like that. Then we go 91 in the phonetics conference in Nexa Provence, prosody was the biggest subject far ahead of everything else. So now it is good times to study prosody. And Petra, I must say, is a very good example indeed, because uh, not only she does not study only prosody, the traditional way, but she sees it is in a multimodal uh, way and very interdisciplinary indeed. So we will have the pleasure to hear what she has to say. Petra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antonis. I'm very, um, I'm, I'm very honored to uh, be the first invited speak speaker in this uh, series of lectures. Um, right, I, I think I should probably start sharing my screen and I, uh, I will talk about multimodal prosody um, and more particularly on cross-modal interactions of form and function, but with a focus on multimodal prominence, because that's just the topic where I probably know most about, but uh, if you have questions on other issues, um, let me know. So I, I do think that we all agree that speaking is not just verbalization, but an intrinsically multimodal activity with not just speech involved, but the whole body involved. And while um, there are findings that the modalities speech and non-speech or co-speech gesture or whatever you want to call it are inseparable, there is still a lot of things that we do not know about the functional relationships about the different modalities. Do they work complementary? Do they work in parallel? And also, we still do not know a lot about the relationship in form. So what is uh, the temporal coordination between the various modalities? And what is the shape relationship? So does the shape in one modality mirror the shape in the other modality? or not, or are they independent? Why do I think that prosody is actually an interesting facet to study with respect to this multimodal relationship? Well, it's basically a claim that myself, together with Sofia Malisch and Stefan Kopp made a couple of years ago, where we stated that both speech prosody and gesture are actually similar in various ways in both structure, but also functions. Um, Unlike verbalizations, both speech and prosody, uh, sorry, both speech, prosody, and gesture are continuous rather than discrete. 
And they're also expressed on a different time scale than verbalizations, superimposing verbalizations, you could say, depending on the model you have. Also, with respect to the temporal coordination, there seems to be a very strong one between prosody and gesture as compared to the uh, temporal relationship between gesture and generalizations in general. Despite prosody and um, multimodal prosody being expressed in different physiological systems. And this is interesting. So the second big function where we have a lot of evidence on is in fact multimodal prominence. Um, and multimodal floor management. So starting with phrasing, there is work by Jelena Krivokapic and colleagues who have found that if you have a typical, let's say, intonation phrase with some pitch accents, a nuclear accent, a boundary tone, that indeed you do find that if there are speech accompanying uh, movements, these also slow down in the vicinity of boundary tones. So, um, and this happens quite in a stable fashion. So we do see that there is something multimodal going on here. With respect to multimodal prominence, again, I will go into more detail later there, but um, just as a starting point, again, we do find that um, there seems to be a lot of multimodal things also going on in the vicinity of sentence accents or nuclear accents. And another area which is maybe most widely studied is multimodal floor management. And um, there you see, and uh, Donald Trump and Angela Merkel just do this in a very nice and illustrative fashion in this picture, which is one of my favorite pictures <laughs> from the last years. Um, namely that while you're speaking, let's say you have the turn, you produce an utterance and you're kind of know that you are finishing the utterance, you want to yield the turn, you say, okay, I'm done. There's nothing I can say on this topic anymore. You do um, express this, not just using prosodic signals, but also you do your, uh, you can use posture changes, um, you do use eye contact. And so you have a lot of, like a whole variety of turn yielding cues, but also on the other side, if you're listening to somebody's utterances, you may use, um, produce multimodal back channel signals, rather expressing, hey, okay, I'm listening, please go on. A nod would be a very typical multimodal back channel. Um, but if you're ready to take over the turn, again, you can also do a couple of things in a multimodal fashion. You can inhale, okay, uh, but also you can use a posture shift, maybe leaning forward, thereby expressing, I'm ready to talk now and tell you what to do. Okay, so these are the three big areas which have been studied, probably floor management and prominence, the mostly wi most widely studied areas. Um, but in this talk, I will now focus on the area of multimodal prominence. Not for a particular reason, but yeah, there is still much to work in that area. So let's, I know that many of you are experts in that area, but um, let's still uh, kind of come back to the function of prominence in general. So there is, of course, a lot of consensus that uh, one of the major functions of prominence is the expression of information structures. So things like relevance or novelty, uh, the most prominent word or syllable often being the one that is uh, in focus as an uh, answer to an implicitly or explicitly um, asked question. So if there's a question who left waffles in Falklands, British left waffles in Falklands, what did British leave on Falklands, British left waffles in Falklands, where did the British leave waffles, British left waffles in Falklands, we all know that stuff. Another widely agreed on a uh, function of prominence, prosodic prominence is something like the expression of contrast or also unpredictability. So the lucky number is one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, or good morning, Peter, good afternoon, Jane, meaning it's a lot later than you think it is, or a stitch in time saves 10. So we know that. 
Another function uh, of prominence um, also has to do with prosodic phrasing. So a certain uh, movement of what we would call nuclear accents also, of course, ha might have an effect on, on prosodic phrasing. Uh, British left Waffles and Falklands or British left Waffles and Falklands. Um, but when, and this is the function, but when it comes to form, of course, there's huge work in that area. And, um, but I'm today not here to show you yet another model or another data in terms of how um, prosodic prominence is expressed in the acoustic um, phonetic way. But just as a reminder, we know, of course, about pitch accentuation, pitch shape, pitch alignment with the ongoing verbalization. Often forgotten, but very important, I think, is hyperarticulation or what you might call articulatory effort. In other words, there's also segmental stuff going on when we uh, emphasize things. We do um, articulate differently, maybe in a less reduced fashion. Um, lengthening, of course, uh, might convey uh, prosodic prominence and also often not taken into account, probably because it's just difficult to measure is the whole range or area of voice quality related things um, which have been tried to be captured in various metrics of spectral balance. Um, I mean, we know a little bit about um, phonation uh, or the, the, the promptness or the abruptness of the vocal folds closure, which um, might or does probably enhance uh, intensities in the high frequency regions, but this is difficult to measure and therefore it's often not part of the prominence models that we're looking at. Overall intensity might play a role uh, and of course because we know this, we ha this has been studied for many many languages in many many different contexts, we also know that there's of course a lot of language specificity going on and um, some universal aspects, of course, as well. But this is not the topic for today. If we're looking at the multimodal aspects, what do we know so far? So how are, is multimodal prominence um, expressed? Um, there is plenty of evidence that if you're looking at deictic gestures or like pointing gestures or beat gestures, beat gestures are these things that often accompany an utterance like I did say not or I did not say that like when there is a nuclear accent often you can accompany that with a beat gesture and for those uh, there's a lot of evidence that they typically these beat gestures typically accompany nuclear accents and typically they also tend to precede them by some time not much but within a certain window um, also we know that uh, co-speech gestures align temporally with prosodic boundaries and very importantly if you're thinking about uh, speech accompanying gestures or movements in general we know that they can they're not just manually manual things going on, but they can also be expressed in the face. So using, for example, eyebrows, um, uh, but also face, uh, um, head movements and other things. So if you're emphasizing something, you probably also move your head in a kind of a nod, but also depending on the language, it might be slightly differently shaped. So, um, this is stuff that has been quite widely studied so far. So thinking back now, what we do know about multimodal prominence, we know often there is something like a pitch accent um, and other uh, uh, acoustic cues going on, something like articulatory effort. And slightly proceeding to that, we find something like manual gesture strokes, head gesture strokes. We also find something like eyebrow movements, blinking, and other things. So prominence expression looked at from a multimodal perspective looks a lot more complex than it already is. So um, this would be my first point for a short time. So um, I would like to ask if you have any questions so far or comments. 
And I don't see if there are any blue hands raised. Is there a question? No? In that case, I would just continue. All right. Cool. Um, okay, so this was kind of the basic intro. And let's go move on now to um, maybe more into the depth of this talk or the, the idea that um, um, I'd like to share with you. So we know, uh, we actually, we don't really know um, how this um, multimodal things that we do find in the data that we have are integrated in the speech planning process. So uh, what, there have been a couple of um, suggestions for speech production models that do include cross-modal integration. Um, but as, at least as far as I know, there is no real work, full model um, of speech production that um, also looks at prosodic prominence or at phon phonology in, in general. So there is a working model, uh, the, the sketch model, um, which suggests that there is a relatively early integration of gesture and, um, and um, articulation or, or speech planning. So, and if that were also the case for um, prosodic prominence or multimodal prominence expression or planning, uh, in that case, I would expect that what we find in gesture should largely follow function rather than, let's say, form or the signal. Um, there is another suggestion, which is not really integrated, as far as I know, in a, in a full production model, which it rather um, suggests that there is a late integration of multimodal cues in terms of something that is often called entrainment. Entrainment being a purely mechanistic uh, process or, um, and if you don't really know what entrainment is, it's, it's hard to explain in, in one minute or a couple of sentences, but um, I think a good metaphor or maybe a good um, idea of entrainment is that imagine you're a piano player uh, who's listening to a metronome beat. So, and, and then you entrain to that beat and you cannot help it. Um, there is quite a bit of, there, there is some evidence that um, multimodal integration is sort of mechanistic and cannot be suppressed actively. And maybe one one idea in that regards would be if you're just trying to do that um, to co-tap while you produce something like the utterance abracadabra or something. So it's easy to co-tap to the stressed beats or the um, uh, accented uh, syllables like abracadabra, but it's very difficult to do it uh, abracadabra or something. No, abracadabra. <laughs> So, and, and that is what's meant by like this being maybe sort of auto mechanistic and, and hard to disentangle, so kind of hardwired. That's the idea. But if, if there is such a late integration, which really takes place where the motor system kind of meets the articulator, then this should yield a very close resemblance between uh, the form of uh, what we find in our motor expression and in our, let's say, acoustic phonetic uh, prominence expression. So early integration should yield a stronger re resemblance of form of, uh, sorry, of function and late integration should yield a stronger resemblance of form and of course, that's difficult to find out whether that is the case. And I probably, I definitely don't have the answer to that. But um, I think we have found a couple of, yeah, a little bit of evidence for one or the other. So again, 
This should be one of my central topics of the talk, early or late cross-modal integration. If prominence is expressed in a non-acoustic modality, does it follow function or phonetic form? The second central topic that I might address a bit later is temporal coordination, because we know that there is a strong cross-modal temporal coordination, um, but we don't really know how strong that link really is. But I'll come to that later. So the first thing I'd like to maybe shed a bit of light on is whether a prominence follows function or form. Um, Sorry, this is wrong here. <laughs> I'll go to the next slide again, um, right away. So what do I mean by cross-modality link and how do I want to investigate this now in this form function thingy, which is difficult to disentangle? Well, we do know that prominence is indeed already perceived as an integration of signal cues and linguistic cues. So even when I'm just listening to speech, I do not just listen to what's going on in the prosody in let's say F0, duration, intensity, blah, blah. But I also listen to, oh, that's a noun or that's something I haven't heard before. So I do pick up on these linguistic cues to prominence. Um, but what if I uh, do now look at manually expressed prominence? So does this manually expressed prominence also take into account these linguistic cues or does it really largely follow the signal, the F0 contour, the duration cues, the spectral cues we have? We wanted to find that out and we did that by um, looking at uh, something which I call gestural reproduction tasks, but you could also say drumming. <laughs> and um, what did we do? We invited a couple of yeah, native speakers and listeners of German to our lab. We gave them a couple of sentences to listen to, and we also gave them a drum pad and a drumstick. And basically we gave them an annotation task. We told them, okay, please reproduce what you hear using this drumstick. And that was the task. And uh, first of all, we found that uh, people were quite that and quite successful. Um, and we also thought this might be a, an interesting way of actually doing prosodic annotation. And um, if it were an annotation task. It was also very successful because it was quick and <laughs> we didn't have to train them or anything. We basically just gave them this drumstick and told them to drum either words or drum along to syllables. Syllable drumming was less error prone than word drumming, at least for German, probably because it's difficult to um, align yourself with different numbers of syllables per drumming uh, yeah, for, per drum beat. However, we also did find a very high correspondence of these drumming intensities because that's what we measured. We measured really how hard they hit the drum pad. Um, and then what we did was look at the, these patterns and compared them to alternative um, prominence annotation protocols. So one prominence annotation protocol we looked at was the kind of p-score uh, annotation method that has been developed by um, Jennifer Cole and colleagues. And you do see on the x-axis uh, what we got for p-score annotations and on the y-axis you see what the corresponding drumming intensities were and you do see that there is a very good correlation of these. We also uh, collected expert uh, prominence annotations. And again, we found good uh, correspondences, both for word, no, actually for words, uh, we did not find very good correspondences, but that's a different issue. You can, we can discuss that later. Um, but again, the expert profiles were very much in correspondence for these drum modulations that we looked at. Um, so this, these results indicate that the drumming task is 
really able to capture fine-grained prominence annotations by listeners. Now, uh, next thing is, is this really a linguistic thing that people are doing or is it just accidental? Uh, we were wondering. So um, we also had an, uh, an accent annotation. So we knew where real pitch accents occurred in, in these um, sentences that people drummed along to. And uh, indeed, we do see with very few exceptions that um, our drummers, so on the right hand side for each individual drummer, you see the drum, uh, the impact forces for the accented words or accented syllables. And for the left, you see um, for each drummer, the impact forces for the non-accented ones. And with very few exceptions, you do see that if there is an accent, people do beat stronger. So um, it is, some kind of linguistic uh, interpretation going on there. Another thing which is super interesting, I personally think, is um, that people do drum different patterns. Now, normally, if you're, if you're um, developing a new annotation paradigm or a protocol, you want to get as good uh, inter-annotator agreement as possible we deliberately went for some more freedom for our annotators because we think it's actually very interesting to look at the variation across listeners. So I don't really care for this task, whether people do exactly the same. I don't expect them to do exactly the same. I expect them to do what they want, what they hear. And uh, you do see very interesting patterns, actually. So this is, these are two patterns for the same sentence on the left you see the word drummings and on the right you see the syllable drummings and you do see again that there is quite a bit of similarity for some syllables but you also see a bit of variation across the different annotators but if you if you calculate inter-class correlations um, the picture looks less messy than um, these illustrations do but we do see individual variation in this task. And I think this might be an interesting window actually to, in, uh, uh, to individual ways of processing prominence or prosody. So um, looking at these differences across individual drummers or annotators or listeners or whatever you want to say, want to call these people, um, you do also find that some drummers do very similar things, but you also see that some drummers do very different things. The red um, bubbles indicate a lack of correspondence, while the blue ones, a strong correspondence. Now, this was interesting. And from there, I wondered, OK, is there maybe something like different strategies in this task? indicating different strategies of perceiving prominence in this gestural reinterpretation of things. And we looked at our syllable drummers for this, and then we uh, performed a uh, hierarchical clustering um, for that. And then we looked at the two clusters that emerged, one very small cluster with only three drummers, and then a larger one. And for those two clusters of, uh, of drummers, we then performed a random forest regression, uh, which is very interesting because for in a random forest regression, you can later analyze the um, impact or importance of the various predictors, um, thereby um, finding out what cues people used in this gestural reinterpretation. And um, interestingly, when we did that, we found um, two kind of different strategies for our two different drummers. In the, one, in the first cluster, we found that the uh, predictor with the highest importance was actually a very linguistic predictor, which is part of speech. So which type of word was to be annotated? Um, followed by acoustic prominence, which is an integrative uh, metric that we used um, uh, which uh, uh, contains uh, a combination of pitch accent 
um, excursion, uh, nucleus duration, spectral tilt, and pitch accent shape. So the second cluster, however, shows a very different picture. In the second cluster, we find a very strong dependence on signal cues. So syllable duration and uh, acoustic prominence kind of beat uh, linguistic, a linguistic cues such as parts of speech. So I think this is a very interesting finding because it might point out that there are actually different strategies and actually different maybe also indicating kind of early or late integration. Yeah, right. So for our cluster one, we kind of have this impact, a stronger impact of function, linguistic function. For the cluster two, we have a very strong following of the signal shape. So um, to conclude um, for this first part of the talk, um, I would like to say, I think we do find that, interestingly, gestural movements, which are not real gestures, but because we forced our people to move along to something that they listen to, are already able to capture very rich prosodic information. And this type of information is very similar to established prosody annotation protocols. However, we find that these reinterpretation tasks show a large inter-individual variation. So this might point to different types of strategies for interpreting prosodic patterns using movement, using gesture. And we also find that these there might be different meaningful strategies of integrating the various cues to prominence that you have in running speech. So some people might be more form driven or integrative, uh, uh, sorry, more form driven or signal driven in this task and others might be more integrative or function -driven, driven. And I don't think, especially the finding that we have some of our drummers closely following the linguistic structure is compatible with the with this kind of hardwired, mechanistic, late cross-modal integration idea. However, this might still be somehow going on. It's just not part of um, the speech production models that we have. And it's, it's really an open question how to, where to put it and how to put it. But so far, I find these two different strategies. So um, this would be the first part now of, of the of the um, empirical studies that I wanted to share with you. So I want to ask you again, if you have any questions here or would you like to discuss certain things? I am just not a disembodied voice. Yeah, really interesting. And this is quite a new area for me, but I'd like to ask you, so you found this really interesting um, inter-individual -indiv difference in strategies, mm -hmm. uh, even though they were doing the same task. So what I suppose one, my first question was, whether you would predict that um, a choice of strategy might also change in the, um, the kind of task. And secondly, um, also whether, uh, how many times each individual um, kind of did the same thing and whether you saw any change so that when something was done a second time and maybe it was a bit more repetitive, mm -hmm. somebody who might initially be function driven mm -hmm. could then become form driven and whether you looked at, uh, whether individuals go one way or the other or they have a range of options and if you looked at that and what your thoughts might predict if that makes sense it, it makes a lot of sense i think um unfortunately i cannot really answer that question because i haven't looked so far at the way that these strategies developed across speakers but it would be definitely worthwhile trying to figure out whether there is a change. Um, um, and I, I do think, I would think that the task should have an impact on the strategy or, or that you can somehow maybe drive people to be more like this or more like that. But, I don't know how to be, I mean, at this, at, in this task, they were all 
they all had the same thing to do. Um, and I mean, we know a little bit about the different backgrounds of the people, but um, there were not enough people to really report anything beyond anecdotal findings here. Um, yeah, I wonder whether if they're musicians, they might be more attentive to the signal, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Well, we had a couple of choir singers and they were more tending towards the kind of uh, the, 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 the function plus, I mean, the, the function strategy also listened to the signal. So they didn't ignore the signal. But uh, what's interesting is if they're choir and they're singing, therefore they're uh, articulating words with the music. If you looked at a drummer or something, mm -hmm. my might be different attention. Yeah. I mean, it may be quite trivial. So. Yeah, we, um, we have two drummers in the set, uh -huh. which is interesting, uh, but we had to get rid of one drummer's data because she always beat to the maximum sensitivity <laughs> of the drum pad. So her data was not informative, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, the other drummer might have been in the signal cluster, but I don't know that by heart, I would have to look it up. Yeah, no, I'm sure it's far more complex than, than most sort of uh, very sort of uh, simplistic hypotheses. But yes, it's, it'd be interesting to, to see how it developed with different tasks and Absolutely. repetition. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Sure. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Are there any other question or comments right now? Uh, Petra? Um, oh, hi. You? Yes, hey. Hey. Hey, good to hey, see good you. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, Peter, uh, I think I've said before I love this study, uh, but um, I do have a question. So it is the case that it's now an external, externally produced rhythm, right? So mm -hmm. is it fair that it, I don't see it as a litmus test of the bottom up or top down per se, uh, approach per se. Mm. Although I do, I see, I do, I do see where you're coming from. Maybe if you're really strict bottom up, but I'm very bottom up, but not too bottom up to think to exclude any of these effects. And I also think. Like I said, what is it's different to attune to a signal that you're not producing yourself. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, th I, I agree that our results are definitely limited, very limited and, and should be interpreted with a lot of care. So I, I don't I don't want to make any far reaching claims. I am also very bottom up, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. A lot more bottom up than you might think I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I, I don't think I understood your second well, if thing, you're saying... thing that you don't want to rule out any of these, uh, uh, like, the, the, so you, you say you can still be bottom up or, or late integration believe in late integration of signals but or well i feel that any bottom-up approach accepts that there is some top-down regulation of whatever mechanistic mm -hmm. kind of basics are going on there um so that's I, I i believe that it's not really test or it's not really evidence against the bottom-up uh, approach I, I, yes I, I, I agree. So I, I think that there is maybe something going on on the motor level that is similar to this entrainment. And, and I also agree that this is not evidence against uh, some entrainment processes going on. Uh, but I think it's, it would be evidence against the purely mechanistic model. So hmm. if, if, yeah. if you say that your ideas are compatible with some kind of top-down regulation, um, then it's maybe not a contradiction. Hmm. Yeah, okay. And maybe I have to go uh, now, but so I'm going to uh, use one more question. <laughs> so, uh, Peter, so you said in the other, in the, in the beginning, you said, well, a gesture tends to co-occur or occurs before. Hmm. But a gesture, you said, is a continuous event. There is no, there is no single gesture going before or after, especially in the, the small time windows that we're talking about, right? Mm. What is it, 200 milliseconds or something like that? Um, so I think we need to distinguish between what a gesture is. It has kinematic points, just like a prosodic mm. kind of contour. Um, so I feel like that we're, and that's something you say in your paper as well. So I think that's not new, but 
I, I think we should move away from saying that a gesture occurs before something. Yeah. Because it's the peak velocity, or if it's just a hold at the end, so with, a, mm -hmm. with, move, with pointing, for example, it's the peak deceleration that actually occurs next to the, or at the same moment. Right. It, it's a very simplistic picture. I totally agree. Um, yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I know you know, but maybe... <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, I think I meant like maximum velocity or maybe maybe yeah. apex or something. So yeah, there I are, think those are yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say that there are points of interest both in a pitch contour and in a in a gestural movement. Hmm. So yeah. Maybe maybe some of these points of interest often tend to be uh, yeah, yeah. a bit earlier. So, but the yeah, whole thing, of course, it evolves in time and uh, it's much harder yeah. to, to, to disentangle and distinguish that. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to get, uh, go. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Bye. -bye. Good to see you. Also, I'm Likewise. Antonio, uh, uh, Antonio, you have the question? Uh, I I have a question, Petra, if I may. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, do you have uh, any data about uh, uh, drummers who are non-native speakers? So, are there any? Uh, do you have? Uh, did you test any people who did not understand German? Because mm. I think that using signal cues may be kind of a backup strategy. When you're, when you're not able to process linguistic information. So if I understand it correctly, the first cluster, the one which is concentrating on linguistic features is much larger than the other one, correct? And you only had native speakers. We but only had- Possible that the people who were concentrating on signal only were, were so much concentrated on the task that they were at actually processing linguistic information and reverting back to a signal only uh, annotation strategy? I don't know. Um, so uh, if, if you tested they, this they, with non native speakers uh, and they yeah. do use signal information, then maybe uh, how much you are able to process linguistic information may shift people towards using one strategy or the other. Yeah. It's possible. Um, uh, I mean, there are findings not on, on this gestural task, but on uh, prominence perception um, by Anders Eriksson, for example, uh, and others who found that uh, non-native listeners pay attention to, to signal cues. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps they all this in, in, in such a task here. But again, here we only had native speakers, or, um, so I, I don't really know why they we find these two strategies. Um, maybe some of them found the task difficult, or they tried to play an instrument rather than listening. I don't I don't know. But uh, if you had the videos, or at least if you know how many times they repeated the task because they were allowed to repeat the drumming, right? They were allowed to repeat the drumming, yes. So maybe people who had more difficulties in the task were the ones who were also uh, using more signal-based cues? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Or it's hard to say what, what difficulty means, right? Um, yeah. It's definitely not correlated with the time that they needed. Um, but it could also be attention or something. I, I mean, yeah, it becomes difficult to evaluate. Try to operationalize, I think, a difficult task difficulty. Um, I mean, we had a, we did have one or two people who did not manage the task, um, but those were not included in the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for the question. I, I promise that there will be a second central topic that I want to address, and that um, is concerned with the temporal coordination of things. So um, basically, um, here 
we were asking the question whether this cross-modal coordination that we did find is actually modulated by communicative needs or is hardwired and uh, stable. And uh, why are we asking this question? Um, well, uh, because in our initial uh, claim uh, where we are stating that there is this very strong cross-modal bond, you could say, we actually do expect that there is a very strong and also temporally stable link between the modalities. So uh, a prominence expressed in one modality should be very strongly and tightly coupled um, also temporally to uh, prominence expressed in a different modality, right? Um, and there is some, maybe not with, the temp with respect to the temporal uh, uh, coordination, but we have uh, evidence by Marike Hitch's work uh, with respect to um, some modulation that might go on um, as a function of communicative needs, because she found, or they found in their work, that when people actually see each other, um, their gesture excursion increases. So um, you might think, okay, there, we do pay attention to the communicative situation in our usage of gesture. So if this cross-modal link is therefore uh, modulated by function, then this also in a temporal fashion, this might also indicate that it's not just a hardwired thing, but can needs to be informed by some higher processes. So this was a question that we addressed in a different um, uh, empirical study. Uh, we have published some of this uh, in, in, in various formats and looking at different um, other questions, but this temporal coordination, that's something we haven't published yet. I, I would have loved to publish it, but then this pandemic came and like we were all busy with other things, so I haven't had the time to write it up. So, but it's still, I think, very interesting data. Um, so the task or the, the, uh, the data that we gathered um, was data that we gathered as part of a um, verbalized game of tic-tac-toe. I'm going to explain why tic-tac-toe, why not something else. And it's basically uh, people were playing tic-tac-toe on a shared game board, but in a verbalized fashion, meaning that they were playing the game, they were um, using little colored felt squares to make their moves on a shared game board that you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, but while they were doing it, they were also saying what they were doing. So they would say something like, okay, my next move is on game number, uh, sorry, on, uh, on field number uh, three or something like that. They did perform this tic-tac-toe game in various visibility conditions. So in one condition, they couldn't see each other at all. In one condition, they could see each other's face, but not the hands. So they couldn't see the manual, what, what they were doing manually with the, the moves. They only could listen to the other person. In one uh, setting, they could see each other's face, uh, sorry, they could see each other's hands, but not see the face or they could see everything, both hands, uh, face um, of the interlocutor. There were a couple of games per condition and we had predefined initial moves to have some kind of uh, variety, variation in the super <laughs> complex game. Um, we then performed an acoustic analysis of uh, looking mostly at the verbalizations of the game moves where they were actually stating the numbers, so the, the target move. Um, this coincided in almost all cases with a nuclear accent and was almost all, in almost all cases, produced at the end of the utterance. So, because that, this has to do with German syntax, um, like my next move is on field number, whatever. So we really looked closely at these 
uh, verbalizations of the game moves. And at the same time, we looked at what people did with their hands because they would also perform the game move with their hands by sticking the felt square to the game board. And we looked at the time where the uh, hand hit or met the game board, right? So this is what we also looked at in the, uh, uh, in the manual domain. Right. Uh, Yes, again, these were our, we had these uh, four different visibility conditions. Um, and uh, the idea is that if people cannot, can only see the face or cannot see anything of the interlocutor, then this uh, multimodal coordination is uninformative. So there, thereby our uh, hypothesis would be that in that situation, there is a less strong multimodal coordination of a temporal kind going on, while if uh, vice versa, if people see each other's hands so they can see the game move going on, also being performed with a hand or under full visibility in that situation, we would predict that there is a stronger temporal link between uh, what's going on in the prosody and in the corresponding uh, manual game move. So um, we also looked at an impact or an interaction with information structure. And for this, the this tic-tac-toe game is actually quite cool. Uh, why? Because it's uh, easy to differentiate interesting things from uninteresting things um, or different types of information structure. So for example, on the right hand side, the, the left um, game board, you see that there has been, uh, <clears throat> the blue player has made a move on the uh, field number five. And that is a relatively unpredictable move because maybe six would have also been an option or maybe even somewhere else. Uh, but at the same time, it's not very important for the outcome of the game. Um, while the right hand side game board, you see the red player um, made her game move on field number seven. And that is highly predictable, but at the same time, it's very important. So we have another reason for being prompt there. So you could be prominent for the reasons of. Uh, unpredictability or importance. And in our setup, we also had a lot of games that ended in ties because people were of course smart <laughs> enough to not lose. Um, and uh, the first game move in every game was predefined. So these moves we always annotated as being given and neither surprising nor important. So we can differentiate uh, unpredictable or important moves from given moves that are entirely predictable and not very important. So this was looked at, yes, and for these, we did predict again, uh, a stronger multimodal coordination for unpredictable or important as compared. So let's look at the results. Um, what did we, no, sorry, first, what did we measure? Maybe more important than the results even. So, uh, as Wim pointed out, uh, gestures are, of course, continuous events. So we have to make a decision where to measure things. And we measured um, the end of the cove, uh, of, the, of the game move, the, the manual game move, which was always the point where the hand hit the game board or met the game board. And we also looked at two points in time in the corresponding um, verbalization of the game move, namely the peak of the pitch accent and the uh, end of the utterance, namely the end of the prosodic boundary as potential anchors for temporal uh, coordination. So, what did we find? Firstly, we were happy to find that even though the data that we looked at were not typical gestures, in the sense that most gesture researchers look at, like date gestures, pointing gestures, things like that, but they were game moves 
corresponding to some verbalization, so very different things, but still the vast majority of our game moves uh, were made uh, within the time when the corresponding field, like the others where people four or seven also occurred. So most of these co-occurred with the naming uh, of the corresponding uh, verbalization. And also in the middle uh, graph here, you see that there's also very close correspondence with the pitch peak. So the majority of our moments where the hands met the game board were slightly before the pitch peak. So that's also a very interesting finding, I think, that overall we do find this established finding that what people do with their hands closely corresponds with what they do with their voices in terms of prosody. Now let's uh, look at our two hypotheses we had. Firstly, we were interested in whether information structure has an impact on this temporal coordination. Um, and with respect to boundaries, we did find in, indeed that if there is unpredictable events or important events, these tend to occur closer to the end of the utterance or closer to the prosodic boundary. Not find clear, very easily interpretable effects of visibility though. When it comes to pitch accents, uh, or pitch peaks rather, um, the situation is maybe even a bit more interesting because we did find an interaction in the sense that unpredictable accents occur comparatively later and they're closer aligned with pitch peaks if and only if there is manual visibility. So if people see each other's hands, then this alignment with the pitch peak or the uh, alignment of manual moves and pitch peaks get stronger than it already is. And you see that in the graph. Um, so the, the density on the left shows that there is this, this is the alignment between the pitch peak, which is at zero, and the corresponding uh, concentration of the, um, uh, point, uh, of the manual movement where it hits the game board. And you really see that there is a very close alignment. While if there is no manual visibility, um, then we see a second peak, which is slightly earlier. And I, I, I still don't really know how to interpret this. Maybe it's kind of a second attractor or something, thinking about entrainment again. Uh, but this is what we found. So manual visibility has an impact on the temporal correspondence between prosodic events and co-occurring manual uh, movements. So um, my second discussion and also my second conclusion would be here that we do find again even though we are not looking at classical gestures or co-speech gestures, that um, there is a very strong coordination between the two modalities, but this, model this coordination is modulated by visibility effects. So we do find a stronger congruence across channels if interlocutors can see each other's movements. The coordination between prosody and co-speech movements is modulated by linguistic functions, so a stronger information load increases this coordination. And we do find that overall that this cross-modal coordination is stable and confirmed once more. Overall, I think we find that this is yet more evidence that the link between prosody and co-speech movements is very strong, but can at least to some extent be modulated according to communicative need. And I think again that this points into some, let's say top, Vim said top or, or uh, more stratigraphic 
planning on that does inform this cross-modal coordination process. So generally, now looking at both studies that I shared with you, I hope to have shown that even very simple co-speech movements such as drumming are able to capture the full richness of prosodic expression and are able to integrate uh, linguistic structural cues to prominence together with signal cues to prominence. So it's a, a very simple task. Maybe it's not a simple task, but it's, it's uh, a straightforward task that most of our participants were able to do and perform. And I think we have also some uh, evidence that this cross-modal integration is not just late, but is somehow informed also by earlier ongoing planning. Overall, I think we have evidence that the speech gesture link is strong and stable, but can be modulated according to communicative needs. In other words, I do not think it's just a hardwired thing, but something that we can to some extent um, control. Um, what I still don't know is what is a gesture. I, I, I mean, we haven't really looked at proper gestures here. We have looked at drumming patterns. We have looked at co-speech movements as part of an ongoing game, but still they seem to behave very similarly to what is often treated as proper gestures. So maybe that's just evidence for the very strong multimodal link in general and uh, is a completely different field of research here. I still don't really know where to put multimodal integration in the speech planning process, I must admit. So take home message, but also caveat, even though the multimodal link looks strong, it can be modulated and it can be vary. And I think that just as in any other area of prosody research, we should definitely, definitely study more languages. Uh, so far, I think it's mostly Germanic languages and Romance languages that have been looked at. There's some work on, uh, I, I think there's some work on, on Asian languages, but uh, uh, Japanese, Chinese, but I think Swedish, uh, Dutch, German, Catalan, uh, Spanish have been uh, looked at more closely so far. So please, we should do something about this we should look at more settings and maybe also different cultures. Um, and one thing that I cannot stop saying is that we have to look closer at individual differences because we saw that our drummers did different things. And I don't think this is just noise. I think this is interesting. And I want to study not just expert ratings, but please also naive listeners because they are not, uh, they are not. Uh, they don't have the problem that they have looked at theory, um, and also I think we should look at perception because stuff today I've shared with you was mostly production data, um, so this is really missing. And this is the end. Thank you, thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to your further questions, comments, or. Other remarks. Uh, hi, this is Grandin from New Mexico. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you very well, Grandin. Oh, Great. thank you so much. Uh, I have a simple question about, uh, you had some plots that had density mm -hmm. on the y-axis. I'm not familiar with that method of measurement and what you're describing. Can you maybe tell me a few more sentences? Oh, it's basically just uh, the, let's say, number of occurrence in, you, yeah, you could easily say it's how many or how often uh, a certain um, event occurred in that time frame. So basically it's, you could also think of it as a, a more elaborate uh, bar plot perhaps where you have uh, um, like the highest number of occurrences uh, are closely to the to the point zero, which is uh, the point in time of the pitch peak. Is that is that enough, or do you want? Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. 
Yes. Danke sehr. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you very well, Marina. Well, great to lovely to see you again and great to, to hear the, the studies. Are always very inspiring and interesting. I have two questions, uh, if I can. Um, the first one is about, um, um, again, well, you mentioned the importance of perception as something that needs to be assessed, particularly when it comes to communication. And I was wondering whether you consider um, these um, these two um, tendencies that you mentioned around the alignment of um, these gestures with with these uh, prosodic peaks, how much of this can really be perceived? I mean, can this if you consider that these nuances uh, mm -hmm. it, and these uh, levels of alignment are things that could perhaps be perceived by by uh, listeners? And on the other hand, I was also thinking uh, whether um, some of these things that we may see uh, and measure, uh, they may not be perceived, but they may be compensated by through uh, the congruence of, of these two things working together or, or the redundancy uh, of, you know, certain prosodic mm. movements with uh, types of gesture. I, I don't know, just thoughts out loud. I don't know what yeah, your thoughts. Um, thanks. Thanks uh, for the questions. Uh, first question, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I had uh, for, wait a minute, so for the, the, the impact of information structure on the coordination, we get a rather strong effect. So, um, I would think that maybe that is actually also easy to perceive or that's something that we can perceive. I'm less sure about the effect um, on the coordination between pitch peak and uh, uh, co-speech movement um, as a function of manual visibility because that is a very, very small, comparatively small effect and I would I, I'm not sure whether that is really something that has an impact on perception, perceptual integration. I, I, don't, I, I simply cannot tell you. Um, one would test, have to test this. I mean, there is some, we know a little bit about uh, multimodal integration windows, of course, for, for other types of gestures. Um, but for this particular effect on, on prominence, I simply don't know. Because um, the, the studies from gesture research that I know have mostly looked at whether people perceive these, these things as co-occurring or not. So that was a different type of question asked. The type of question I would ask here is whether this has an impact on the perceptual prominence. And uh, that I haven't tested. Mm -hmm. Is that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, then we have concluded the, the first round. And Petra, I would just repeat, in a sense, what you said. I think it's quite important, this drumming methodology, to see how it coordinates with speech. So applying to other languages, I would say stressed languages versus tone languages versus phrase languages like French to see how it works. But I would say that it is a positive approach. You have talked quite a lot about this and then a semi-question and quasi-question would be this with gestures and speech. Uh, I have a feeling that it is a huge variability. I mean to say, ideally, it may be a, some, some type of coordination, but I have the feeling it's a huge variability. I remember, because I have noticed, the Italian the Italians, when they want to say that something is very good, they do like this, a molto buono, 
Hmm? And usually they raise their hand after they had said the expression. Or sometimes they do it parallel, sometimes before they raise the hand and so forth. On the other hand, we speak on the phone and we gesture all the time without having any effect and we know this. This might be something intrinsic to language and language culture, I would say. So what would you say about this huge variability, I would say, or is it as I think and the variability is indeed much less? Well, I'm not a gesture researcher, but of course there is uh, not a gesture researcher of the type of gesture that you mentioned, where people are looking at uh, conventionalized gesture. And these, of course, vary vastly across languages, cultures, and so forth. Um, I do think, however, that this, uh, these prosodic effects, I, I think they are pretty hardwired. Um, and this might explain the thing that you just said. Why, why are we gesturing on the phone? Because we cannot help, we just do. And uh, this, at least I have seen in all countries I've been to so far. <laughs> um, so I, I would think there is something universal going on. There seems to be the strong cross mode link. Um, but again, I think to some extent it can be modulated based on the language, the language's uh, phonological, but also other uh, linguistic levels of um, coordination, or, uh, sorry, of, uh, of structure. So yes, I, I think you're right. So some things definitely are very uh, but the strong link, nevertheless, seems to be there. I think there is plenty of evidence for that. Well, thank you. If uh, we don't have any more hand raises, uh, we say we have concluded this very first, uh, the premiere of our lecture series and uh, Let's thank all participants, but first, and most of all, Petra, who has dedicated her time and effort to present this lecture. Shall we clap hands for... <laughs> Thank you, Vetra. Bye bye. Thank and I see you next time. Look, check in our site. <laughs> More lectures are coming. Bye-bye.